The Teaching of the Master by Brother L. G. Sargent Part 2, Chapter 10 The Believers and the World Matthew chapter 5, verses 13 to 16 Ye are the salt of the earth, but if the salt becomes tasteless, with what shall it be salted? For nothing has its strength any longer but to be cast out and to be trodden under foot of men. Ye are the light of the world. A city cannot be hid that is set on a hill. Neither do men light a lamp and put it under a bushel but under a lampstand, and it shineth unto all that are in the house. So let your light shine before men, that they may see your good works, and glorify your Father which is in heaven. The character of the citizens of the kingdom of God, who are embraced in his covenant, has been portrayed in the Beatitudes. In the address recorded in Luke chapter 6, verses 20 to 26, similar blessings are accompanied by woes pronounced on the rich, those who are full now, those who laugh now, those of whom all men speak well, for they too will experience a reversal of fortune. Having received their consolation now, they have nothing but condemnation and its consequent mourning to come. Their treasure is not in heaven, as James tells them with a clear allusion to the words of Jesus. They have laid up their treasure in the last days. Those who trust in riches will then find their gold corrupted and their garments moth-eaten that on which they have depended will fail them utterly. In Matthew 5, verses 3 to 12, however, this class are only referred to indirectly. When the blessings on those who are persecuted and reviled show how the people of God will stand in relation to the world around them. This thought provides the background for two sayings which follow, when Jesus shows what the disciples are to be in themselves and toward the world. Ye, he says emphatically, are the salt of the earth. Salt in a warm climate is a necessity of life. Being abundant in the land of the salt sea, it was freely used in food and medicine, and even with animal fodder. Any meal would include salt in some form, and so to partake of a meal with a man was to eat salt, and the sharing of a meal meant, as among the Bedouin today, to enter into a fellowship. A covenant was accompanied by a sacrificial meal, and a covenant of salt was of peculiar sanctity and durability. God gave the kingdom over Israel to David for ever, even to him and to his sons, by a covenant of salt. Doubtless from this association with a covenant, salt entered largely into a ritual use. As a condiment it represented zest in contrast to insipidity. As a preservative it was an emblem of incorruptibility, as against the inconstancy of human nature, and by use it became the symbol of faithfulness. Every oblation of thy meal offering shalt thou season with salt, neither shalt thou suffer the salt of the covenant of thy God to be lacking from thy meal offering. With all thine oblations thou shalt offer salt. It is possible also that salt was used in the preparation of the incense, as the words rendered tempered together in the authorised version of Exodus 30, verse 35, are by some rendered seasoned with salt. To the man of the world, meekness, poorness of spirit and the rest are insipid virtues of the feeble, the under-vitalised, the inferior, 
They are the mark of the slave morality. To Jesus, exactly the reverse is true. The men of God are not insipid but salty. It is they who have savour and strength of character. When human pride brings rivalry among the disciples, he can tell them to have salt in themselves and have peace with one another. The salt of humility gives the savour of peace. But this potent quality of life does not belong to men by nature. How is it attained? Only by the self-discipline which is self-sacrifice, even to the extent of cutting off the offending hand or plucking out the wayward eye. This salt is a sacrificial quality and is only gained by presenting your bodies a living sacrifice. The great sacrifice in which the new covenant was to be sealed was not yet offered, and could not at that stage enter into the teaching of Jesus, though it might be present to his mind. Nevertheless, he is undoubtedly teaching that the people whose is the kingdom must be the true covenant people of God, and the description of them as salt links them with the salt of the covenant of thy God. Underlying all the sermon is the continual contrast between the true Israel and the false. Theirs is the kingdom, means theirs and not others. And so now, with an emphatic pronoun, he says, Ye are the salt. But the threatened fate of Israel was a reminder that salt remains salt only so long as it retains its potency. True salt indeed will remain chemically the same, whether dry or in solution, but the imperfectly purified substance in daily use in Palestine might, in practical experience, become tasteless through the effect of damp. A little salt might be useful as manure, either spread on the land or added to the dunghill, but the refuse from spoilt rock salt was good for nothing but to be thrown on the track where it was trampled in. Salt which had deteriorated in the temple store might be used to make the steps less slippery in wet weather, or on the sloping ramp up to the altar, which became dangerous through being covered with blood. In any case, it was trodden underfoot of men, a striking type of rejection. They are as dust underfoot. Such salt was said to have become saltless. This was the state Israel after the flesh were approaching. And R. F. Weymouth, in a footnote to his New Testament in Modern Speech, says, The second sentence of verse 13 is our Lord's first recorded prediction of the divine rejection of his fellow countrymen. A rejection then so near, consequent on their failure to respond to their divine election. Still more was it a lesson to the disciples that if one generation were rejected, so could another be. Their standing as the people of God depended on a continuing saltness, not on an arbitrary selection. Because of unbelief they were broken off, and thou standest by faith. Faith with all that it implies in the quality of life. Hebrews 6, verses 4 to 8 is a pointed commentary on the same idea. The saying refers to the whole of the qualities which Jesus has said are blessed. But it has a special bearing on the last of the Beatitudes. Will they remain constant to him under persecution for his name's sake? The question is not only whether they will continue to profess that name, but whether they will remain truly and not merely nominally the covenant people of God by retaining the salt of the covenant in their lives. Without the Spirit of Christ in its meekness and purity, 
they are none of his, and fit only to be cast forth. It was with this in view that the disciples so often emphasised the need for suffering meekly under reproach and persecution. When Jesus uses salt as a figure in Luke 14, verse 25 to 35, this responsibility of discipleship and the need for constancy in the undertaking is the most prominent idea. Here in the sermon, the thought behind the figure comprehends all the meanings he gave it elsewhere. The implied contrast with those who were Jews outwardly is even more apparent when Jesus says, Ye are the light of the world. For this was unquestionably the function assigned to Israel of old. Moses exhorting Israel to keep the commands of God says, For this is your wisdom and your understanding in the sight of the peoples, which shall hear all these statutes, and shall say, Surely this great nation is a wise and understanding people. Jews themselves recognize that this contains in substance the idea of the missionary purpose of Israel's existence, and that this is frequently emphasized in prophetic and rabbinic literature. But this missionary purpose is implied at a still earlier point, when they are told that if they keep the covenant, they shall be not only a holy nation, but a kingdom of priests. For whom are they priests? Priesthood implies a two-sided relationship, not only to God, but to men. As a man, taken from among men and ordained for men in things pertaining to God, a priest is both a teacher and an intercessor. These were the functions of the Levitical priesthood towards the twelve tribes, and though the analogy cannot be pressed to apply to peoples outside the covenant who have no appointed means of approach to God, the priestly kingdom must have some function towards the peoples of the earth. That function was to be a witness to God by observing his laws and thus to teach by example. Indeed, an analogy drawn from the household of faith would suggest that intercession was not included, for Paul exhorts that supplications, prayers, intercessions, and giving of thanks be made for all men, on the ground that God, who is our Saviour, willeth that all men should be saved, and come to the knowledge of the truth. The purpose of God that all the earth should be filled with his glory was inherent in all his dealings with Israel. And Moses, as Paul shows, looks forward to the day when all nations will rejoice in the Lord. In the accomplishment of that purpose, Israel were chosen as God's spearhead. And so the Lord could say of them through Isaiah, This people have I formed for myself, that they might set forth my praise. The purpose for which they were chosen from among the nations was never at any stage for their own sake alone. It was in order that through them the blessing of Abraham might come upon all families of the earth, and that by this means God should be glorified. For this end Israel was as a city set on a hill placed in a land unique in its geographical situation, they were at the meeting point of the rival cultures of the ancient world, on the passageway of its traffic and the battleground of its clash of forces. David and Solomon raised the kingdom to a brief eminence, and the visit of the Queen of Sheba is both an example of what its influence might have been and a type of those Gentile kings who will come to the brightness of Zion's rising when at last her divine destiny is fulfilled. But even when power and prosperity had gone, the world could not be blind to the distinctiveness of Jewish life so long as the law was observed and the temple worship maintained. 
Two dangers beset Israel throughout their history. The first was that they would cease to be holy. Becoming like the nations around them, they would no longer have any witness to bear. The other was that they would cease to be priestly. Becoming self-righteous, they would cease to bear to others the witness they had. The filching away of the court of the Gentiles for the trade in sacrifices and exchange of money in which the house of Annas had a vested interest was a symptom of Jewish failure on the second of these counts in the Lord's day. But whether they showed to the world the love of God or their own selfish hatred, they could not be hid. Commentators have pointed out that Safed, visible from the supposed scene of the delivery of the sermon and nearly 3,000 feet above sea level, would very well answer the description of a city set on a hill. While Tabor, familiar to the Lord throughout his life in Nazareth, was also probably crowned with buildings in his day. But another city, even more fitting as an illustration, might have been in his mind. When he was a boy of twelve coming to his first Passover, if the pilgrims from Nazareth took the route through Perea, they would toil up the steep and dangerous road from Jericho. As they breasted the Mount of Olives, there would burst on his eyes one of the most remarkable sights in the world. High on the hill of Zion, gleaming all the whiter by contrast with the shadowed cliffs of the grim Kidron Valley, he would see the snowy limestone of Herod's temple flashing with gold. No imaginative boy would forget the experience. What picture must it have left on the vivid mind of the boy, who a few days later was to be found asking questions of the rabbis in the temple? That picture would be renewed year by year until he was thirty as he came up regularly for the feasts. There, in all its beauty and significance, was the city which was the very embodiment of Israel's life and purpose. The day would come when he would weep for the desolation that was to come upon it, and when he would take the disciples over that valley of the shadow to the slope of Olivet, there to tell them as the sun went down behind Jerusalem, the signs when these things should come to pass. His disciples too, this remnant, this other Israel, would inherit the duty of witness to the world. They could not be hid. As a community of believers they would be seen, known and judged. But they could hide their light. And whether they would be seen to the glory of God would depend on the light shown by each individual member. The saucer lamp burning all night was a sign of life in every home. For the lamp to be put out was a synonym for the extinction of the household. To put the lamp under the household bushel measure would be a futile act, which no one in his senses would do. The earthenware lamp would be placed on a three-forked branch of a tree, cut and inverted to form a stand, and thus lifted up in the humble one-roomed dwelling its glimmer would give light to all that were in the house. Similarly, in the bridal procession, each of the virgins carried her lamp on a pole, fitting into a hollow cup which would contain the reserve supply of oil. And beyond all this homely illustration, Jesus would not be unmindful of another symbol the seven-branched lampstand which illumined the holy place. The community of believers who are in Christ Jesus is represented by the golden lampstand fed by the two olive trees in Zechariah's vision. Dr. Thomas says, Without this light-bearing body, the world in all ages and generations from apostolic times until now would have been in lightless outer darkness. The one body has been the golden seven-branch light-bearer 
in all the gloomy period of the times of the Gentiles. While this is true, it must not be overlooked that in the words of Jesus the light represents works rather than words. It is a paradox that men should both persecute the disciples for righteousness' sake and yet glorify God for their good works. Yet it is true to experience. Men, sometimes the same men, both reproach and respect to the righteous, and the genuinely Christ-like character never fails to win some abjuration. But a particular light is thrown on the passage by an illusion of Peter's, when he exhorts the sojourners of the dispersion to have their behaviour seemly among the Gentiles, that wherein they speak against you as evil doers, they may, by your good works which they shall behold, glorify God in the day of visitation. Calumny, as the Lord had foretold, was a common experience of believers, and Suetonius uses the very expression evildoers of the Christians. But Peter says that the people who have spoken against them may one day end by glorifying God for them. A day of visitation will come, the phrase is without the definite article, visited by God's grace, their conversation will be aided when they look back and recognize the true character of the lives they have witnessed. They will find beauty in the very thing they had vilified. There was a man who watched the stoning of Stephen, and yet lived to glorify God for the martyr's witness. If, however, as is possible, Peter is thinking of the final visitation of God's judgment in the last day. The idea is not substantially changed. It is still that the converts will rejoice in the influence on their own lives of conduct they had once despised. But these results can only follow if the works of believers have been good, gracious, beautiful, honest in the Latin sense which is now almost lost from English. For twice in the one sentence Peter uses his Lord's word. That beauty of life can come only by reflection from a life more beautiful. Its motive power is a love which has an origin beyond human nature. A new commandment their master gave them, that as he had loved them, so they should love one another. And he added, By this shall all men know that ye are my disciples, if ye have love one to another. By this a light would shine whose source none could mistake. And in this Jesus is truly the revelation of the Father. For the point of his saying in the sermon is that men will not fail to recognize the Father's likeness in the children, and so glorify, not them, but him. With this we reach the end of the first section of the sermon. Jesus has pictured for the disciples the character which has its foundation in faith in God as Father, and in a clear conviction in his kingdom and his righteousness. This character is revealed in the very conditions of evil which exist in the interim before the kingdom is established. In those conditions the character must retain its unfailing savour which belongs to the covenant with God. And behind this teaching on the way of life is the fact that the pattern character which he paints is his own. It must be so for he is the king, the anointed of the Lord, and from him the kingdom must take its character and its law. By him the ground of citizenship must be defined. The messiahship of Jesus is nowhere stated in the Sermon on the Mount, but it pervades all the teaching. Who else could set forth the basis of citizenship in the kingdom? For this reason claims which could be made only of the Messiah are taken for granted 
as needing neither assertion nor demonstration. They're not incidental to the sermon, but inherent in it. From the first of the blessings onwards, this is a manifesto which could have been issued by the king of the age to come, and no one else.